Conversations on Dance at the Vail Dance Festival is generously underwritten by the town of Vail. I'm Rebecca King Ferraro. And I'm Michael Sean Breeden, and you're listening to Conversations on Dance. Welcome, everyone, to our final Conversations on Dance event here at the Vail Dance Festival. My name is Michael Sean Breeden. And I'm Rebecca King Ferraro, and we are the hosts of the Conversations on Dance podcast and former dancers with Miami City Ballet. And we're so excited to have our final guests here, Dennis Drozdjik and Antonina Skobina, ballroom dancing extraordinaires. Um, it's our first time speaking to both of you, and we're, we've been watching you here at the festival for years now. Um, but we always start with a very similar question for our new guests with um, just sort of getting an introduction to how you came to dance to begin with, and maybe when that started to center more um, on a ballroom focus. Let's start with Dennis. Thank you, Rebecca and Michael. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for coming, everybody. Um, well, I started to dance in Ukraine. Both of us are born in Ukraine. And in Ukraine, there's a big ballroom dance culture. Basically, it's actually more popular than ballet and other dance styles. It's like thousands of kids dance. So it was, it was like a thing you do. And in Ukraine, every kid after school does a lot of activities like music school, language school, dance school, athletics. So every day from Monday to Friday, you have things that are, if, you, if you're not part of some circle, then it's not normal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, my mom, she used to dance Ukrainian folk dance, oh. and she went to like a Kiev uh, ballet academy, but she, her form wasn't right, so then she, they put her into folk dance. Mm -hmm. So she always dreamt of her kids dancing, and that's how I got into it. Mm -hmm. So from four, I started with ballroom dancing. Oh, wow. And did you take to it right away, or did you ever play with other styles of dance? Um, no, I took, I just did, uh, at four, I started with ballroom dance, but as, as kids, you do like polka, uh, uh, triangular walls, mm -hmm. things like this, like preparational dances. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I also did gymnastics at the same time, music school, so it was... Um, but I didn't do any other dance styles until I was uh, like 12. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. How about you, Antonina? For me, it's the same story. Uh, I started when I was seven, just when I started school. And then my grandmother, actually, she saw advertisement that a local ballroom dance school was uh, uh, like getting students. And that's how I started. I love that. We were remiss to mention that we have a special guest today. We have oh. Sunny, the dog here. It's our, our first canine guest. <laughs> yes. And is he napping right now? He looks very comfortable on stage. Yes, he's <laughs> chilling. He's chilling out. So what was the training um, in your early years like? And was there a certain point where you kind of had a, a cognitive decision to take a professional path? Uh, well, for me, it was at first, I would say, like the first months when I was seven, when I started, and then... For me, it was kind of, I, I didn't know what I was doing. And then the pivotal point was where we had a very strict teacher. And at some point, she saw that I wasn't taking it seriously. So she put me in front of the whole group of kids. And she asked me to show the steps that we all just learned. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't do them because I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> oh. So she put me in the middle of the circle and just asked me to demonstrate. And I felt like a total failure oh. at seven years old. Oh. All the kids looking at me like, oh, she doesn't know the steps. And from then on, I thought, okay, I have to take it seriously. Mm -hmm. And then I became serious about it because I didn't <laughs> want to have the same situation. <laughs> those are the things that dance nightmares are made of, right? Yeah. I feel like we've all had those. moments. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> How about for you? Uh, for me, I think I was like, as a kid, I always tried to do well in school. So I was the kid that tried to be good in everything. So um, at a certain point, you have to ask yourself, why are you doing something? Is it because you're just trying to be good at it or because you really love it? So for me, the moment was, I think, after finishing high school that I had to sit down and really ask myself, why am I dancing? Is it because of a momentum that, you know, because when you start at four, you know, you're unconsciously already doing it. So 
and then there's these expectations that oh maybe you should do dance, maybe you should do something else. So uh, after high school, I had to sit down and like make a list of questions, and uh, why am I dancing, and uh, is this something that I want to do professionally? And some of the answers I came up with is like when music is playing, I have this urge to express it physically through movement and through choreography, and that's when I felt that okay, this is uh, this is something I, I want to keep going and you know try to do professionally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. One of our favorite things about doing this podcast is we get to talk to people who um, do different dance styles. Mm-hmm. So for us, you know, as ballet dancers, you if if you have like a common trajectory, you will you know go to school, then you'll get into a company. What does this look like for you guys? Like, how are you moving into the professional sphere? Mm-hmm. Well, in the ballroom dance world, it's very different. Um, the, there is the common trajectory. What people usually do is. They, um, it's, it's a competition world. So you grow up, you, uh, get better doing competitions right. every, you know, as a kid, juniors, juveniles, youth, uh, and then you get to a professional category. And the goal is to win in the professional category, mm-hmm. to be like top six. Uh, the biggest competitions are world championships. Mm-hmm. And there were, used to be this competition. It's called Blackpool Dance Festival. And it, the most prestigious one, like Wimbledon. So everybody wanted to be in the top six of mm-hmm. that competition because if you're top six, then you can do more shows, you can charge more for shows, you can have more less, you can teach more lessons, mm-hmm. you can cha- charge more for, so your business as a, as a dancer professional, that's kind of where, where you get it from. So mm-hmm. your reputation. Um, some dancers, uh, a, a, a new path opened up. When was it? Like when Dancing with the Stars started all over the world, like mm-hmm. Strictly Come Dancing. Uh-huh. And some dancers kind of went towards that path, which is a nice opportunity mm-hmm. you know, right. for everybody. So, um, but unlike, uh, ballet world, there is, there is no, um, in, in competitions in ballroom is like the end stage. Mm-hmm. Right. Whereas in ballet, competitions is a, is a springboard to a professional mm-hmm. company. Right. So that's very different. Yeah. So something that's interesting to me right now is that um, you must have to be sort of your own agent from a young age. You know, in the ballet world, you you end up in, under the umbrella of a company and then you expect your employers to do things for you. Yeah. Um, but what's that like? How did you have to find your own paths to being being assertive and putting yourself out there from quite a young age? Uh, it's very difficult, as you say, because uh, if, if you're a ballet dancer or a contemporary dancer, um, a lot of times you're invited and it says, for example, um, a dancer, New York City Ballet, or mm-hmm. dancer, right. ABT. And a lot of galas and a lot of events, they need that certain uh, cert- validity because mm-hmm. that's what people go and see, right? Mm-hmm. When they see American Ballet Theaters, so, okay, it has to be, it's a stamp of quality, mm-hmm. right? so to say, certified by. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in our case, uh, we don't really have that. You know, so we didn't have that. Uh, so we were trying to, to, to path that we were trying to get that is through just performing and getting people to invite us for what we do. Mm-hmm. Like it's a, a dance number or uh, something different that we present that people want to have in the program and not necessarily uh, that the name that stands behind it. Right. Um, the other path is uh, TV, TV, TV world because it does work, you know. We did uh, World of Dance TV on NBC, and NBC, and also helped us to get more work opportunity and kind of to get more buzz right. around you. Because right. for, I remember we were in uh, in Italy, and uh, we were having dinner, and beside us was a, a person who was like 14 times world champion, <laughs> and uh, and then there were some Americans in, in Italy, and they're like, "Oh my God, we know you guys," blah blah blah, blah. and then but we were like. There's this person who is much better, you know, 14 in world champion. But for people, they just, they know it's, TV. it's more important mm-hmm. that they know you, that they can recognize you. So right. TV, TV is a big thing for us. Right. Well. How about social media? I mean, we've talked a lot at this festival, what it means in the ballet world. How is that kind of evolving <laughs> things as well? Antonina? <laughs> She's like, I'm, I'm distracted by my son. <laughs> <laughs> Doggy wants to get up. back up. Derek, could you repeat the question? Yeah, just social media. I'm just curious yes. how that's factoring in. Uh, well, social media is a huge part of it. And a lot of gigs 
that we get, they mm-hmm. all actually come from social media. And it's very interesting how that works. Because sometimes, like, people will be looking at you for years. Mm-hmm. And then they're like, okay, for years I have been watching your guys' work. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, then I make this decision to hire you. So for us, it's also a great way of connecting with our audience. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do believe in the power of social media. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. How did you first um, meet one another? And then what made this feel like an ideal collaboration, both in terms of the artistic output, but also in branding? Well, we have kind of a fairy tale story. It's very <laughs> long. I'll try to keep it short. Yeah, love but it. Uh, when I was 11 years old, my mom, she took me for the first time um, to Europe to watch a ballroom dance competition. And it was one of the biggest ones in the world in Germany. And uh, it was in Mannheim, Germany. And we came there and I was overwhelmed with what I saw. And uh, Dennis, he was at that time superstar. He was a world champion. Mm-hmm. And uh, <laughs> he wins this competition. And he was our favorite. Like, we were cheering for him. And, oh. and then he won this competition. And there's award ceremony. And his face is on this big, big screen. <laughs> and um, I, I'm a little younger than Dennis. And my mom looks at the screen and she says... In about five years, this will be your partner. And I'm like, Mom, that's impossible. (laughs) He's a superstar. (laughs) No, what are you talking about? So she missed it by one year. (laughs) Six years. Oh, my Uh, God. Dennis um, uh, became my partner, and it was actually, again, very interesting story. So at the age of um, 16, I moved to Germany to train with Dennis's coach Mm -hmm. because she was really, really good, and she was in Berlin. And uh, just when I arrived to Berlin, Dennis just left a few weeks ago to study at the Juilliard School in New York. So we missed each other. So I start training there, and uh, then I go home for Christmas to Ukraine, and uh, I have this dream that I'm dancing with Dennis. So (laughs) I wake up, my mom makes me pancakes, and I'm like, Mom, I had this dream. You remember this boy, Dennis, that we saw five years ago? She's like, yeah, I slightly remember. And I'm like, have a dream that I have been dancing with him. She's like, okay. So I go back to Berlin and I tell this story to our teacher. And she wanted to get Dennis back into ballroom. For her, it was was very sad that he left it and went to Juilliard. So she like, we're driving in her Mercedes and she starts smoking. Like she's a big smoker. and <laughs> And she's like... I'm going to call him. And I'm like, no, no, this is just, no, this is, this is just a dream. So she calls Dennis after some time. At that time, Dennis is in Canada with his parents. And at that time, he is thinking, okay, I want to get back into ballroom. That same day, he's talking to his parents. Oh she gosh. calls him and she's like, I have this girl. I think she would be a good partner for you. And, uh, and then Dennis came to Berlin to try out with me, and it was connection from the first touch. It was just like oh. electricity when we touched hands. Mm. So that's a short uh, version <laughs> of the story. I think that deserves applause. That was so <laughs> lovely. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, speaking of your coach, I'm wondering if we could delve into training a little bit more. Like, how do you how do you find the optimal coach for you? Is this sort of like word of mouth? You know, what what is the right training? I mean, maybe also to offer some advice to aspiring young ballroom dancers. How do you find the right path? Oh, it's very difficult. I think there is, now that I have more experience in how I teach my students, I think that's how they should be taught, which is very different than how I was taught, mm-hmm. you know. Um, in, in Sadly, in ballroom dancing, uh, the situation is that, you know, you have these teachers, and some of them are considered gurus, like, mm, kind of culturally developed. Oh, this is the person that, and if you get a lesson from them, you should be thanking, like, uh, the God that you got a lesson from them. Mm-hmm. Right. So there's kind of a little bit of that culture going on, which is unhealthy. Um, how how I would teach my uh, students now is, for example, I think like ballroom dance technique, uh, then um, a lot of dancers, I think, uh, should have like mental training, 
uh, similar to psychology because mm-hmm. um, in, in my professional career, I had uh, I was able to provide uh, to deliver good re- results in the studio, mm-hmm. but when it came to performing, they were they were worse. You mm-hmm. know, so I was like, why is this happening? Especially under competition environment, you're stressed. Mm-hmm. So I think mental training is really um, important for that, mm-hmm. and right. uh, uh, acting, theater training, I think, is very important. Um, other dance styles like well-rounded so i tell my students okay go take ballet go mm-hmm. take um, african dance go take haitian dance go take samba go take jazz you know so but when we were trained it was mostly the culture is uh private lessons mm-hmm. you know you right. need to have private lessons with your teachers which are the lessons are very expensive so um you are it's a little bit like a selective thing where if you don't have the money uh, well, you know, sorry, there's right. nothing, there's nothing can be done about that. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are there things that are happening to make that more accessible? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> the opposite. It's becoming more and more, uh, dependent on, on the finances that you have, mm-hmm. sadly. And the, and the trajectory of that is because ballroom dance is a little bit like a, professional ballroom dancers started appearing in the 90s because mm-hmm. in the 80s the dancers who were dancing they were like okay he was a lawyer and a ballroom dancer mm-hmm. you know right. so in the 90s you had the first generation of truly professional dancers who were uh, who said this is what I'm going to do with my life right. and in the 90s beginning of 2000s it was about the dance form mm-hmm. and because of their teachers who were the lawyer and the dancer you know, they, they got their money from being a lawyer, mm-hmm. so the dancing was something they did from the heart. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So their priorities were, you know, we want to see this, we want to see celebration, we want to see beauty, we want to mm-hmm. see art. But after time, this new professional uh, generation that retired, they're like, okay, I spent my life doing this, now I want to make money. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> and basically they started taking apart the industry and kind of dividing mm-hmm. and... Um, trying to get as much as they can from mm-hmm. people. Right. Mm-hmm. Hearing you talk about competition, um, mm-hmm. I would have thought that you would say like, I love competition, I love that thrill. Not that you're not saying that, but you're talking about the uh, mental mm-hmm. part of it. So can we talk about that a little bit more? Because that's something that's foreign to us mm-hmm. and what that mental state is and what work you do to feel really good in competitions. Well, the way ballroom competitions work, for example, if you take the big ones, it usually consists out of six rounds. So each round is five dances, Mm -hmm. and then you start, let's say, 400 couples, then they cut 100, and then they just go, for example, to quarterfinal, semifinal, final. So you got to really pace yourself uh, because in one day you have these six rounds from morning until very late evening. So it's like a mental game. Uh, there are also a lot of couples at the same time on the floor. So you would have like 24 couples on the floor dancing at the same time. You have one minute, 45 seconds per dance. And um, you have a number. I have a number in my back. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, judges have literally like one or two seconds to make a decision. So what's tough about ballroom competitions is that you have to be on every mm. single second. You cannot take it easy because you never know when judge is looking at you. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's why it's tough. So physically, it's really tough. Mentally, it's really tough. You are constantly fighting for attention mm-hmm. because there are 23 other couples dancing with you and the time is very limited. So so um, competitions like teach you a lot. Like if I look back when we were doing competitions, they they build strength like in in anything in life right. because you carry carry this feeling on into everything that you do. Right. I like that about attention because on Friday night, the second you guys stepped out, I was like, whoa! Like <laughs> it was like electric. Like you could tell that it was just like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd like to hear a little bit more about Dennis's detour to the Juilliard School. What inspired that choice? Were you just wanting to explore other forms of dance? What was what was the decision making process sure. there? Uh, may I add something to what Antonio said? Of course. Of course. Yes, uh, and because of the competition environment, you have, for example, you're coming out on the floor, and then there's 20 other couples, or 24, and a lot of them are good. So 
you know, it's like an, a mental game because you see them and he's like, oh, this is good, this is good. So you're like, okay, what am I doing here? Uh, so sure. after some time, what really helps with that is um, when you start kind of using keywords or um, visualization, you use different phrases like mental training, uh, which which set your mind and keep your mind in the on the right uh, trajectory. Like we see in the Olympics sometimes mm -hmm. when some players they're like literally talking to themselves. Okay, I gotta go do better. I gotta do better. I'm mm -hmm. I'm new to this. So kind of this right. self talk. So a lot of these techniques they're really important to get you um, because you can be you can be good and excellent all the way until 30 seconds to your performance time, and then 15 seconds, something happens that takes you out of it, mm -hmm. and then your performance is below. Suffers. Yeah, suffers. Right. So it's really important to, to get, to know how to get into the flow zone, mm -hmm. you know, where you're just kind of, how we like to call it, just kind of channeling, becoming one with the universe, kind of channeling things, mm -hmm. feeling energies, and then staying there and not allowing your mind to take you out. Yeah. Are these methods that that your coach is bringing to you? Or are these things that you've sort of come up on your own? Oh, these methods is something that, you know, my coach back then, he was he was basically saying, you suck at the competition and <laughs> your face looks like you're digging potatoes. That was <laughs> that was my coach's comment. And, uh, or, or you were like, he was like, you're not sensing. And I'm like, well, teach me how to sense. It's mm -hmm. like, you're not sensing, but they stop there. So mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I need to find things, answers on my own. So I started researching books about mental training and uh, um, also reading about acting. So a lot of things you just kind of, I, I dug out from the books and just trying things mm -hmm. out by my own. Mm -hmm. May I also add for our audience that we don't know at the competition which song is going to play. So oh. we we know which dance it's going to be. Let's say it's the cha cha, and you have the rhythm or the samba, but it's every time different song. So that's also that element where you are forced to keep it fresh mm -hmm. and be responsive to the music that you hear. So everything is like um, very very high sensitivity mm -hmm. uh, mm. on the competition floor, and you also get hit a lot. There's a lot of traffic <laughs> jams happening, so you gotta like um, be yeah. very alert on the spot. And sometimes you get hit in the head, <laughs> and you have to keep going. So it's um, it's a very, very interesting environment. <laughs> That's so funny because I was just thinking like, oh, you can kind of zone into each other and not worry about the other dancers around you and get like, be, like you're saying, they're really good, they're really good. But you have to. You have to be seeing what they're doing. <laughs> so you can't really... That's the think. goal, to be zoned with each other. Right. But... Uh, there are so many like uh, distractions, dis distractions mm. happening. You bet. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. Well, maybe now we could circle yes. back to the Juilliard <laughs> session. No, that was great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> so when I live, was living in Germany, uh, you know, I have the German structure of ballroom dance is very was very good at the time. It was like these federation. It was like sports, basically mm -hmm. federations uh, of the city, federation of the country. Like in soccer, everything is like a system that's built. You know. Mm -hmm. So I had competitions every weekend. And uh, for five years, you know, basically that was my life. So it was like competition, competition. So after five years, I was burned out. Yeah. And I was like, I need to do something else. And uh, at that time, I finished high school and I went to a contemporary dance school in Berlin, which was directed by um, a former Graham dancer. Mm. And she graduated from North Carolina School of the Arts. Mm. So she was an American. She was like, ah. <laughs> uh, and uh, it was a very different energy than... Um, other dance schools, and I had contemporary, I had ballet, I had Graham, I had Horton there, and she, then she was like, what do you want to do, Dennis? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. And then she's like, why don't you try, you know, some educational institution, some schools, why don't you audition? And uh, at that time, I had no plans, or like, no plans at all to move anywhere. I had like, no plans to move to the United States, and I didn't even hear about Juilliard or know about mm. the school. And um, at the same time, there was a boy, an exchange student, who was auditioning for schools. So, and I look at him, and he's making solos, and he's like, "What is he doing?" And then I was like, "Okay, maybe I should try it at least." So, um, my goal was to firstly to expand myself as a dancer because for a lot of time you know you do the same movement patterns so it's like i need to i want to be more versatile and more 
um, have more language to speak with as a dancer, and I want to be in an environment which pushes me to develop artistically. So then I said to myself, okay, I want to audition to uh, Juilliard, and I auditioned to Fordham and Ailey School. So mm -hmm. I, I flew by myself to New York, and I auditioned, and um, uh, I was an international student, so I was like, okay, if I, even if I get in, like, how am I going to pay for it? <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, so, but I did it anyway just to try, and you know, luckily uh, Juilliard accepted me, and they they called me and said you got accepted, and like I was so super happy. But then at the same time, I was like, okay, I I can't pay for it, you know, and then I had to wait for scholarship decisions, and then finally they said that they can offer me a full scholarship, wow. which was like you know unheard of for international students. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how my journey into Truly, are segued from Germany. Uh, and uh, Dennis is very humble, but I would <laughs> like to add that Dennis is the only and the first ballroom dancer to ever get into Juilliard School. Oh wow! <laughs> <Thank you>. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you two built your reputation together. You're saying obviously through competitions, but then you find yourself on TV and you're in the festival circuit. What were some of the important steps to getting your talents out there and now to having established yourself in this way? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I think after doing ballroom competitions, um, how it started is that we were trying to be to get into the top six to be first in ballroom competitions. Mm -hmm. And we were experimenting with things, but unfortunately the ballroom dance industry is also very political. So uh, basically the judges have very limited time, so they judge who they know. Mm -hmm. That's that's what it comes down to. They judge who, who take lessons from them. And uh, some couples, oh. <laughs> can't even imagine, some couples spend over $100,000 in one month just for lessons. Some couples spend millions <gasps> a year on lessons. <laughs> and then they win. And then they get into sure, the sure. wild. Yeah. So it's, it's a crazy, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you more about it. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this is a whole other podcast we yeah. can dive into at some point. <laughs> and uh, so, but we didn't want to get to go that route of doing political lessons because I believe that, you know, if you have an, uh, it's similar to a painting. If you're making a painting and you go and you ask 10 people, what do you think should be better? In the end, the painting will be unrecognizable and you know, the artistic, uh, the vision will be lost. Mm -hmm. So the same thing in dance, I believe that you, know, you should have your vision and you follow it, and, um, but somehow that doesn't work in ballroom dance because it's political. So we kept changing and trying things and being more creative, being more artistic, and through that we kind of developed a name in the ballroom dance industry of being kind of more more ex experimental. Mm -hmm. uh, we included more contemporary elements. We tried to push the boundaries of ballroom dance. Um, and a lot of people in the ballroom dance world, the judges, they're like, oh, we can't compare you to what other people are doing because it's, um, you have to do the same thing as them, you know, mm -hmm. so we can compare you. But then I was thinking, well, how about you go and you educate yourself better about different dance styles and then you can judge it on an artistic basis. But mm -hmm. I didn't say that, of course. <laughs> 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 and uh, so uh, with time, the ballroom dance industry kind of pushed us out a little bit because they didn't want to accept what we were doing. And as well, if you're doing competitions over and over again and you get you know, kick in the butt, mm -hmm. after some time you don't get fulfillment and you're like, why am I doing this if they don't, you know, if, if it's not appreciated. Sure. And... Um, uh, we, we always wanted to bring ballroom dance more into the performing art world. Mm -hmm. So we tried to um, l look for more theater show opportunities and more performances that are outside of the competition. And uh, uh, also in TV world. So we did a few TV shows that... TV, TV shows are actually very... Uh, it's a very good school mm -hmm. for whatever dance style you're doing, I think, mm -hmm. because... Uh, in the TV world, you're not performing for an audience that loves ballroom dance, or you're not performing for an audience that loves ballet. Mm -hmm. You know, they're just people who want to see dance. Mm -hmm. So you need to you need to experiment with dance that uh, that is understood by a wide public of people. Right. And then through that experimentation research, you uh, develop also your own voice. 
but f going from that into kind of the concert dance world, uh, it was a I think it was like partly the work that we did and partly luck. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody in the ballroom dance world uh, knew us who was also connected to the concert dance world. Mm -hmm. And then they invited us for a gala. From there, at that gala, somebody else saw us. And they invited us for more things. Mm -hmm. and from there, we kind of uh, reached out to people and we also said, hey, we love doing this. You know, here are some of our material. Mm -hmm. We would love to perform. And slowly, slowly, it started to grow like a network, but it's very hard to move from one world into another world. So yeah. like if you're in the ballroom dance world, it's extremely difficult to move out of it and to be known in the, in the concert dance world sure. or into commercial dance world. Yeah, I'm just, I'm thinking when you're saying that you guys, you were more experimental and you're pushing the boundaries, it, you know, with the Olympics going right now, it makes, it reminds me of moments where, you know, famous uh, athletes in the past have been penalized for pushing the boundaries. I mean, who, what's the name of the famous ice skater who did the backflip and it was like, you're out. Um, uh, no, wait. Hamilton. Scott so. Hamilton. There we go. Yeah, you know, Thank so you. it's, 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 uh, I, you guys are just, you're mavericks of your form and people will eventually, start to copy what you're doing and that, you know moving outside of that realm i think is it's important for any art form otherwise it's just static right like strictly ballroom has anybody seen strictly ballroom yeah. like you know that that moment when they say you're making up your steps or these strange <laughs> steps but in reality that's how it is you know mm -hmm. if you're making something yeah. and it's a little bit different that's how judges and people react oh no you can't do that mm -hmm. it's uh, so strictly ballroom is actually very good it's it's it, you know it's a satire, but in a way it's it's a representational of how it is. That's funny. That was one of our questions: was um, how ballroom dance is perceived in the media or put out in the media in movies, in TV. Do you feel like sometimes with ballet we'll say like, oh, they, it's not accurate in the way that we want. It's more dramatic. It's you know all of those things. How do you guys feel that ballroom dance is presented to the population? It's pretty accurate. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you take the most famous ballroom dance movies, which is strictly uh, come dancing, right? Um, then Shall We Dance with Richard Gere and Jennifer Lopez. It's pretty accurate. It's, uh, every time we watch it, we just see the characters like we have in our ballroom dance world. It's almost the same. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. That's funny because, you know, I, I feel like we used to, I, or I used to watch these ballet movies, especially something like Center Stage, and be like, that's not real life. Now, the older I get, I'm like, oh, okay, I know exactly who this person is. It's, it's, all, it's all real. <laughs> Maybe that's true, too. <laughs> Maybe you could um, delve into uh, the sort of, I guess, choreographic process a little bit more. Um, how much back and forth do you guys have? Or do you ever bring in outside influences or choreographers? What's that like, the creative process? So we choreograph all of our work and the way we um, start the choreography starts always with the music so the music has to really inspire us um, and uh, then we think about the story and the message that we want to bring with the piece and then it's really a very collaborative process so we never bring anybody mm. from the outside before we used to get trained in certain things like we would hire a teacher to teach us some tricks some lifts so we used to do that before but now we have kind of a repertoire of uh, things that we like and that we can do and uh, and then we just just start creating the choreography so uh, it's a very collaborative process it usually takes us uh, about a month to create a piece mm -hmm. and what we do we videotape every single mm -hmm. second mm -hmm. so we because we are by ourselves we have to choreograph we have to also coach ourselves we have to get it ready to be like performance mm -hmm. ready so video is really important to us. And when we create choreography, like every five seconds we film, then we watch, and then we are like, okay, oh, this wow. is not good enough. Mm -hmm. This is not strong enough. So then we start reworking. And that's kind of wow. how it so have thousands of videos on that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> like your iCloud storage yes. bills must be astronomical. <laughs> but also to the point, you know, about other choreographers it, it's also because 
um, how the industry works. Like if you're in a ballet company and the choreographer comes in, you know, you're paid as a dancer to work with that choreographer. Right. For us, we have to pay the choreographer, and right. choreographer fees mm -hmm. are very expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, if you want to invite somebody good, it's at least, I don't know, 5,000 for at least, like the minimum, I think, for a piece. And mm -hmm. then if you're doing a performance where we get paid, I don't know, 3,000 or 2,000, yeah. maybe we have to pay 5,000 for a choreographer, right. then right. it doesn't add up. So yeah, right. we were like, okay, let's, you know, let's push our creative minds and create something of our right. own. And uh, with time, uh, we developed more of like a working style and a signature and um, it doesn't mean that we don't want to work with other choreographers. We would love right. to, yeah. but um, it's just how, how it's structured. It's not uh, you know, financially feasible Practical. as well. Yeah. yeah. I wonder when you have gigs, what are some of the parameters that you're given or are you given carte blanche? Like for example, here at the Vail Dance yeah. Festival, when they have you come, what is Damien telling you that he would like to see? Well, Damien is extraordinary. <laughs> He's like a real inspiration to us. And uh, the way it works with Damien, it's actually, I think he kind of trusts us. Like was the piece that we performed yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, we kind of choreographed it and just showed it to him at the rehearsal. <laughs> and uh, he approved it <laughs> for the performance. So sometimes Damien might ask, okay, I want, like last year when we did Veil, vale, mm -hmm. he wanted a Tony Bennett tribute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we came here to Veil, vale, and uh, Tony Bennett has recently died back then. And uh, he just said, okay, I want this piece with Robbie Fairchild and the band. So we kind of created it here in two days. Wow. It's different than a month, huh? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. yeah I think Damien and, uh, you know, Veil Dance Festival is very different from other venues because also the spirit of Veil Dance Festival is a bit very adventurous. Um, and it, there's a feeling here that you can also fail in what you do as an artist, you know, because mm -hmm. You're not failing, you know, you're just experimenting and that's already a success. And um, so Damien, you know, trusts you. Um, if he invites you here, he kind of already shows trust and what you do as an artist. Uh, in other venues, how it works is that you usually, for example, send in a video and you send in like 12 pieces. Okay, this is was what I can do. Mm -hmm. And then they say, how about you do this and this? Mm -hmm. or, or for example, if we have rehearsed uh, recently maybe four pieces then we say okay we can do this and this mm -hmm. and then they invite you specifically to do those pieces mm -hmm. but in our case uh, it's already kind of a people invite us to to break up the program in a way a little bit <laughs> right. right because a piece that we do is usually dynamic mm -hmm. or usually some there's some passion involved mm -hmm. uh, some emotions so um, it kind of brings a little bit more variety to a program for mm -hmm. example if it starts with uh, uh, like a contemporary piece and then a Balanchine piece mm -hmm. and then if we're then if we follow then it's something more a uh, little party, you know, a little there party. And, <laughs> or, and then it goes and it keeps going so mm -hmm. it's uh, that's I think how people who invite us see a little bit us mm -hmm. on the right. program how did Damien first invite you to the festival and how many years have you guys been coming out since this is our third year um and uh, I think how it worked, we wanted to be at Vail Dance Festival for many years. And I think we even messaged Damien like a long time ago, mm -hmm. but he wasn't like inviting us. And then <laughs> three years ago, he finally did. Uh, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so um, I guess, I guess time and maybe he, mm, kept looking at mm -hmm. our work. I don't know. I don't know. We never <laughs> asked Damien. Um, we're going to get to the bottom of it. We'll that's, <laughs> that's an interesting question. But <laughs> we're so grateful to be here. And every time we come to Vail, um, it's, it feels like it's a art planet here. Like everywhere you go, there is posters of the festival. Um, everything is for the artists. The way they treat the artists is just incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, the way Damien communicates with the artists. So we're just very, very honored and happy to be here every year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I, I was just curious because so much of what you do is just the two of you. And then I wonder when you're here at a festival like this, when there are so many other dancers around, how that is for you guys to kind of have like, f- maybe feel a little more sense of community than you might otherwise. Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Well, we also, we perform a lot of different galas, so we are kind of used to it. Yeah. But um, it is wonderful to be in this environment because everybody is... Everybody here, all the artists, they're so kind with each other and so friendly. So there's zero rivalry. Mm -hmm, Uh, It doesn't exist here. It's just the friendship, uh, kindness, and uh, it's a very, very special place. Because sometimes you go and sometimes you feel at different places some elements of... uh, different emotions but here it's just i don't know it's just perfect yeah yeah <laughs> it's true must be so different from competition <laughs> very different yeah. very different i have no idea <laughs> yeah no, i mean that's making me think uh, damien really does have a skill for not merely um attracting talented people but the the vibes between all of the artists You know, I was just kind of going through the seven years we've been here. I'm like, yeah, no, there's never been someone that's just like, I have to win this show. (laughs) Right. Yeah, that's true. Well, what else can we expect from you in the final days at the festival? What will you be performing? Um, Well, tomorrow we will be, oh, today, today. (laughs) (laughs) Today we will be performing um, the number, it's called Feel the Rhythm. And it's kind of a rhythmical latin inspired number which Mm -hmm. is more fun and uh more playful so it's a fun number to perform for us and uh it's not overly complicated uh and the accent is more on communication (laughs) (laughs) between he goes up he gets hot and then he wants to get down (laughs) yeah (laughs) we're talking about sunny coming up and down up and down (laughs) Yeah, we're, uh, so that's a number we're performing today in the evening. Mm-hmm. Um, we're teaching a master class today at 2 p.m. Oh, ballroom. how fun. And uh, tomorrow I'm teaching another master class. I think it's like jazz ballroom fusion mm. type of thing. That sounds yeah. really fun. <laughs> well, we've so enjoyed having you at the festival for the past few years, and we hope you're out for many, many more to come. But I think for now we'll send it out to the house to get some questions from our audience members. They ask better questions than we do. (laughs) (laughs) Let's start with Sarah. When you talked about competitions and knowing the dance, um, but you're not knowing the music, I assume that Dennis really has to lead. Um, One of the tensions in beginning ballroom dancers is who's leading and women relinquishing that role to males. Is it is it different in a competition versus learning a choreography in, in terms of who's in charge and how you manage that? Mm-hmm. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, the In the competition, the rhythm is known. So, for example, that any dance is called uh, after a rhythm structure. So if it's a cha-cha, you know, it's two, three, mm, 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 mm. That's a cha-cha. Rumba is two, three, four, two, three, and each for each dance. So we know the rhythm, but still, um, to make the quality of the dance good, th- I have to I have to lead every step, and Antonina has to kind of react to it. Uh, if there is no that interplay or communication, then um, then the the movement is not full, not uh, not fulfilled. So to say, you know, it, it becomes it, it's not a it's not a conversation anymore, because when when we have a conversation, it's a different feeling and energy than a scripted uh, like a scripted choreography. So although the choreography is set within the choreography, I still have to lead the step, and she has to follow and react. Um, so that that's part of the craft and art that we always work on. That everything has to be led by me and she has to respond to it um but it's not like she can't initiate things she can also initiate and suggest things physically speaking does that kind of make sense i i was i believe i heard that you're 
opening a dance school in the United States, if not more than one. Could you elaborate on that, please? Yes, we um, we have been teaching for a very long time already, and we have had students of different ages, from kids to adults. And now we finally opened our own school in New York. It's called DNA Dance Academy. And um, um, we're kind of trying to build the school. And um, um, right now we have already quite a few students. And uh, um, it's, uh, for now, it's uh, it not like we are leasing a space. We are renting space out. Mm -hmm in other space, because in Manhattan, that's the only way you can start. Right? Um, but we have already a group of kids, you know, they're really wonderful, uh, talented kids, and it, it, we're not pushing them or forcing them to do competitions. We are teaching them, um, uh, what, what we love to do is also bring out, out of the kids, something that's born in them, you know, their soul or their, their talents, their, their genius. Um, so we look for that in the students and the kids, and we try to uh, draw it out. Uh, and that's that's what the most exciting and fun part for us is, because um, there was this philosopher, and he said, you know, uh, genius is what 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 makes up genius is imagination and and in a way knowledge. So. A lot of people kind of think that genius is knowing stuff, but it isn't. It, it a lot of it is something that is already in you, and uh, we don't want to override that. We want to bring it out, but give the necessary information as well along the path. We don't want to. We don't want to. What is it called in like hardware? Scan disk, you know. Um, and uh, we see a lot of that happening. Also, in, we deal in the dance world, so we see a lot of that happening also in dance, where by the age of around 9, 10, uh, kids, it's already very difficult for them to bring out who they are. They just, they just give you the information they, uh, they kind of processed. So what, what happens is they dance or they perform, and... Uh, uh, the movements that they do, uh, they th they think they're good because the teacher said they're good. You know, kind of that's the validity where it comes from. But they lose a little bit of that sense of uh, this is this is me in a way. So we try to uh, bring it out for them from them, and that's what is really inspiring for us as teachers. Thank you. I'm just going to grab this because I want to ask this question so much. <laughs> So I've been coming to the DeVale Dance Festival for, well, for eight or nine years or so. Mm -hmm. And when you guys showed up three years ago, it was just mind-blowing. Oh, I mean, you. it was mind-blowing both in terms of the craft and the art that you did, but also because they brought you in in the context of what was really a kind of a tr more traditional uh, ballet thing. Mm -hmm. And last year was also, you know, spectacular. And I think you've noticed that every time you dance, you get standing ovations. And there's a reason mm -hmm. for that. This year was a little different. Last night was a little different, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how you made that particular dance with some of the mo things that, I mean, I don't know what all the, the, the moves could be, but there were some interesting things that you did that I haven't seen in the earlier years. Mm -hmm. Well, for this particular piece, we were inspired by a few directions. Um, firstly, we were inspired just by the music and kind of the, uh, the trance quality of it which is very, you know, and th that quality is something that persisted in, you know, in humans dancing. That was kind of the original idea why people started to dance, just kind of for moving and healing purposes, right? Like the voodoo and the healers, they kind of get you into that state. Uh, some other inspirations were like Pina Bausch dance theater, you know, where they have kind of this flowy and theatrical movement. Um, and uh, another another inspiration was uh, like La 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 Human Steps, it's a contemporary company. Uh, they're, they're still, they still exist, right? In Canada, I think. And, but before they did like really physical work and it was really inspirational. So for, for this piece, I think we wanted to not base it on a particular style. Okay. This is, a, this is a number that's, let's say, like a jive or a pasodoble, but we wanted to 
just use different movements to express an idea that we had and not tie it to a particular dance. I'm not sure if that kind of makes sense. And just, just explore any ideas that we had and wanted to do just to try it in the, in the choreography. Great. Well, the crowd loved it last oh, night. Thank you. <laughs> Can we pass this way, actually? Thanks. <laughs> I think, yeah, it's enough. Um, thank you uh, so much for your performance <laughs> last night. I was in the second row, and I, w I used to, I was a ballet dancer professionally, and I taught for a really long time. And the, the choice what, that you made in, in the work that you presented, for me, it just blew me away. The, oh, thank the, you. Thank the, you. Uh, just the variability in, in what's in your bodies that you could pull from, you know, uh, as a, the dancer, how I was trained and how many of us are trained to watch performing artists on the level that you are both on pull all this crazy range. It was, uh, and the choreography was, was really amazing. Uh, it's just mind blowing. And all I could think about besides how amazing it was, was I thought, what kind of injuries do they get? Because yeah. <laughs> I was, I was question. looking at your, at just the feet, I, you know, the angles on the, on the ball of the foot and the metatarsals and the ankles and how you use your back and your neck and like that everything's pulled so taut, you know. Mm -hmm. It puts ballet to shame with with regard to in many ways because it, there's so much force in the at least so much um, direction in in where you're going like it's very sure and that feels somewhere mm -hmm. and it does. Uh, yeah because it's a lot you can really tell that just the the amount of uh, absolute accuracy you know that costs physical money. I know it does, right? So yeah. if you can, I, I'm, I'm praying for health for both of you. I don't want to say anything, but it's really amazing what you're doing. So thank you. It was really, it was so fun for me to watch. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for your kind words. Speaking of injuries, oh, where do we start? <laughs> I don't even know. Well, just like yesterday was a very tough performance for us because I was very sick. Um, I have this cold and I couldn't breathe and uh, I took a bunch of medication just to be able to breathe and to tell you the truth, like 10 minutes before the performance, I had absolutely no energy. I was just standing there and I was like, I have no idea how I'm going to do it. And uh, then I just went into the corner, I just prayed like I always do, I just ask God to help me pull through it and uh, it worked I, I don't know how the body works it's just like like yesterday my body was totally empty it was sick you know it didn't have energy and then you just go on stage and then you take your position and you still don't know how you're gonna pull it through <laughs> and then the lights go on the music starts and it's like a different force enters your body and then for like three and a half minutes you push through it and then you're dead <laughs> <laughs> but speaking of injuries we have a lot of injuries and uh um for i think it's like the knees the back uh, shoulders um we don't have um, a lot of i think and ballet dancer a lot of ankle injuries we don't no, I have a lot of ankle injuries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I used to have a lot of ankle sprains. And what really, really helped me, uh, one of the doctors, he gave me this mental program, which I share with all my students because uh, I used to have these terrible ankle injuries. And he told me, like, before you go on stage, just stand on one foot, lift the other foot up and just create a direct connection between your brain and your foot like no thoughts in between just draw this direct thread and that has been life changing for me so I would just stand I would just connect my brain to my ankle and um, it's been really really helpful but for example last year no, two years ago, right? We did this TV show in Canada, and it was very physically demanding. So at one point, I had this extreme, extreme shoulder injury. 
Like I couldn't, I couldn't do simple tasks like lifting my phone or like dressing myself. But I was still dancing, and uh, I was still doing the TV show. And I knew that if I go to the doctor, they'll tell me that it's something really, really bad. And if I know that information, it will affect my performance. So I pushed through it. I pushed through the whole taping of the TV show. Every day in pain, taking tons of, uh, like, uh, Advil and everything. So then I go to the doctor, and he says, you have three tears in your shoulder and a slightly detached biceps. How, how did you do uh, the show? I have no idea. So he said, you need a surgery. And uh, I was like, oh, surgery, no, I, I'm so terrified of blood and needles. And <laughs> it wouldn't work for me. So uh, what saved me was acupuncture. Acupuncture saved my life. I never tried it before. I never believed in it before. But what this doctor did to my shoulder, he literally healed it. So, but um, yes, yeah, sometimes we dance with terrible injuries and just audience doesn't know. And I, I guess all dancers go through it. And I think for ballroom dance, or a particular style that we developed, what's difficult is that we have to be uh, mobile in the body, so you have to be like, you know, very flexible. But for lifts and other things, uh, you need strength and you need stability. But we can't concentrate on one or the other, we have to show both. But the more, you're, the more flexible you are, the more destabilized, you know, your joints, so the more, if, I, if I'm flexible and I lift her, I'm prone to more injury. But if I'm strong and I lift her, then I can't be more flexible. So it's like, okay, which one? So you need to do to do both and to find that middle ground. Um, and also, uh, just a comment to what you were saying. Uh, in in our case, um, we also need to be aware of what other dancers are doing. For example, we know we can't compete with ballet dancers. You know, if if I do an arabesque. Nobody wants to see my arabesque because <laughs> somebody else's arabesque will be better or somebody else's tour and layer will be better. And uh, so I know I, I don't, I'm not going to show this because I have no, no competition on this. So, um, or, or, or not, not competition, but the quality is not mm. the same. So then I think, okay, what can I offer that other artists can't offer or it's not on the program that will be exciting for people um, and still, still give them something. So uh, I think then we search for things that we can offer uh, where we are good, and we don't try to offer things where we know that uh, what we do is not good. So in terms of, I see it like a X and Y axis. You know, X is the range of what you can do, and the more you go into the X, uh, um, it's good. You should develop it, but at a certain point that reduces the quality of what you can do. And so you can do a lot of things, but you can't really do anything good. And um, and then there's the why, is the depth of what you can do. For example, some artists, you know, they can do one thing, but they can do it so well that that's all you want to see. So we have to kind of consider expanding the range, but only far enough where you can still have the depth of what you do. Uh, if that kind of makes sense. Yeah, that's great. I think we have time for maybe one more question. <laughs> I want to circle back to the school for a minute. In Michael certainly had the experience, and if we go through all the uh, strip mall <laughs> dance studios, there'll be 30 <laughs> girls and two boys and in the ballet world, you won't start partnering, doing partner work until very advanced. But it seems like uh, in ballroom, you've got to have a partner from minute one. And we see all these 10-year-olds on uh, social media doing it. But how do you get enough boys? It's mm, a good question. Well, luckily, the, the boys for ballroom dance, they are less resistant a little bit. You know, because it's it's not, I don't know, they're more likely. In our school, for example, we have maybe 40% uh, boys and 60% girls. You know, so it's uh, it's almost half and half. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
Um, maybe because the way ballroom is, it's more dynamic, like energetic, so they feel like they can prove themselves, mm -hmm. or and there's that quality. And uh, we did a few experiments uh, where we give our kids two choices. Okay, you can do this solo, or you can do this exercise with a partner. And they're like, our kids are like from four to eight, you know, some five, six-year-olds. And all of them choose the partner work because they want to dance with a partner. That's, that's the part they most find the most exciting. And uh, so when they're there and they're holding hands and there's something like special happens at that moment where you feel that they really enjoy and they're excited for that moment, right? So that's what I, that's what I observe. And actually that's what I find keeps them in the dance class as well. You know, although boys may not express it, but you can see that they enjoy um, leading a girl at six years old. You know, they're very like <laughs> proud and, um, and we have this one boy, he's like four and he, he has a partner that's like maybe uh, sometimes she's like seven or eight and she's like much twice taller than him. <laughs> but still he's very, he's like, <laughs> I'm partnering this girl and she, he's, feels, he feels very kind of, you know, uh, accomplished doing it. So um, I think that's an important uh, from what we discovered, it's an important element to keep dancing, to keep kids excited about dance is because it builds community and they can interact with each other and uh, I don't know, there's something special about that. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much. This was so fun and we really appreciate it and thank you to all of you for being here with us another great year at Male Dance Festival. Thanks, thank everyone. you everybody. Thank you so everybody. much. Thank you. Conversations on Dance is part of the ACAST Creator Network. For more information, visit conversationsondancepod.com.